السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم Welcome to another edition of Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali, on this wonderful Wednesday morning. Lots coming your way. I'm pretty excited for this uh, show today. We're going to start off with uh, Cara Blackie. She's an educational psychologist. We're also going to be talking genetically modified foods with Zakia Isma. And we'll be wrapping up by talking about diets. Um, we're into the third year of uh, third month of the new year and I think people are still battling with weight and eating healthily and also perhaps wondering what it is that they need to be putting in their children's lunch boxes. Well, our dietitian that's going to be joining us is going to tell us all about that and she is Fatima Bucks, uh, diet issues, healthy eating and most importantly, what do you do to try and lose those extra kilos? All of that coming up with uh, um, coming up in the program this morning. We do hope you're going to keep us company by calling in if you have any questions or comments. The lines will be open throughout the show and the telephone number will be scrolling at the bottom of the screen. Welcome, it's great to be with you and we're going to start off with our educational psychologist, Cara Blackie. Now it is said that more and more parents are resorting to have their children go for extra lessons. Uh, they go for tutoring or tuition, depending how you pronounce it. And they believe that this gives their children an extra edge as far as difficulties in schoolwork is concerned, or even if they're just battling socially. Does uh, tuition work? Does it give your child the extra edge? And does it come at a cost? At what cost? Cara Blackie, good morning. Welcome good morning. to the program. Thank you. Okay, Cara, before we go to tuition or tuition, uh, why is it that some people refer to it as tuition and others tuition? I think it might just have to do with sort of where those words have come from. So maybe more of an English kind of word to more of an American based explanation of words. So I mm -hmm. think it predominantly means the same thing. It's getting sort of extra kind of assistance with the educational side. So it's not wrong if I say tuition or tuition? No. Okay, great. So we're going to talk tuition today. Okay. And that's where you come in, yes. obviously. You're an education psychologist. Um, born and bred, I presume, in Johannesburg. Yes. Tell us about the type of work you do. So the type of work that I do predominantly is sort of school-based assessments. So ranging from school readiness assessments, so when kids are about to go into grade one and you want to find out sort of where they're at, to, you know, throughout sort of their school career, to even after sort of high school even, just to be able to see what kind of careers they are interested in going to. Do they need any kind of extra support within school? And that's where often um, from the assessment I can gauge if a child needs tuition or any kind of support with regards to their educational functioning. Are parents open to the idea of having their children being assessed? Now I know um, back in the day yeah. there wasn't such a thing as assessments but now it seems that these services are so readily mm. available. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if schools offer them as a matter of course or mm. Is it the pa parent's responsibility? And what is that going to do for the parent, the child, mm. and perhaps even the school and mm. the teacher? I think some schools do have psychologists on the premises that offer these kind of services, but often parents want to go to someone external to get an outside view of their child without maybe being tainted by what teachers feel. Um, it, it is quite readily available, which is good. I think it helps all of the people involved to have a better understanding of what can be done so it helps the child just maybe being heard understood within you know where their weaknesses are where their strengths are as well and not just focusing on weaknesses but picking up what they're actually good at and what they can do which i think sometimes in a classroom we forget a little bit because we complain about all the things they're not doing without sort of commenting on what they are doing and what they can do really well it helps the parents also form a better connection with them as well. So understanding their emotional side, understanding where their weaknesses are, 
Also understanding concentration. Is it a concentration difficulty? Is it an avoidance because the work is hard? What's going on? It really helps the parents as well to then also hopefully filter through to the school where the teachers then can be a little bit more hands-on or understanding within the school environment as well. Some children view tuition uh, very negatively. Mm. It's almost suggesting to them that I'm stupid, I have a mm. problem, and that is why I have to go for tuition. They don't necessarily feel good about it. Yeah. So what's, you know, how do you then um, sell the idea to the mm. child? And this is a child who might have a difficulty in a mm. certain subject. What about the child that is doing well, mm. possibly in a mm. you know, straight A student? Is it necessary for that child to go for extra lessons? Why would mm. parents send an you know, straight A child mm. for tuition? I think sometimes parents do do that because they want their child to do even better. Um, it can also offer just that little extra support. So if the child just wants to, especially for subjects like maths or English or something like that, it just often helps a little bit with more support within that subject. So maybe the children, they're a little bit more anxious or worried. It helps maybe calm their anxiety. Um, but I do feel that if kids are already doing well and they've got lots of sports and lots of homework, I wouldn't recommend them sending to extra lessons and tuition every day of the week because then it becomes too much. It causes more anxiety for them. It's more pressure for them. So I would, you know, for, for kids who are already doing well, it should be a supportive thing, not anything that's going to cause more pressure or stress on them. But for children who are having mm. challenges, you know, at mm. school, this obviously is going to interfere with their extracurricular, yeah. like sport, etc. Yeah. How does, how would you advise parents to mm. balance that? I think it's important for kids to be able to have also their, their activities they enjoy. So I would maybe pick one or two activities they would enjoy after school, so if it's a particular sport or cultural activity. And then if they are struggling, I would try and arrange um, tuition on the other days. Or, um, you know, having private tuition that comes to the home. Mm -hmm. um, and then it doesn't take away from traveling and driving them there. They come to the home, so it's sort of that homework session, but you've got support for them at home. But that obviously comes at a price. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, affordability of sending your, ch uh, you know, your child or your children mm. for tuition. Um, what, what sort of you know, ballpark figure are we looking at these days? I think it depends. So a lot of the tuition companies have um, group settings. So there will be about 10 or 15 in a class, but each working on their own program. So what level they're at, and they work through a particular program, but they're in a group setting. So they do get individual attention, but there's also a bit of individual work that they have to do. So that's a little bit more affordable because it's not one-on-one. -on -one. When it becomes more one-on-one -on -one attention, it does get a little bit more expensive depending on what that person's qualifications are. So if they are sort of a remedial teacher or have speciality to help kids with certain sort of foundational skills, then it does probably become a little bit more, more expensive. Um, but then there are also a lot of sort of students, university students that offer specialized subjects. Um, so they help more with the sort of the high school students. And then it's not always as expensive because it's not um, covering a whole range of things. It's just particular subjects that person specializes in or what the child particularly needs. How do the parents know Mm. that this is working for them and their mm. child. I mean, you know, they're sending the child for extra lessons because they want the child to have that edge or mm. assistance in the areas that he or she is struggling mm. in. How do they gauge that this is working for our child? Yeah. What sort of measurement is there to check that this is working? Yeah, I think that that's a tough question because Firstly, sometimes kids don't want to go, so that could be a bit of an indication that's not working because if a child is refusing to go most mornings or afternoons and, you know, is miserable and tired, they're probably not going to learn much because they're going to have a bit of a mental block and not wanting to pick up anything that that person's trying to help them with. So you can get maybe an indication of, is this person working for my child? Um, because it does have to do with a bit with personality. Some yeah. people work better with others. So you can gauge from the child, but then also asking them for some kind of feedback. You know, so instead of just letting it go for a long period of time, saying after a few weeks, what are you working on? How things been going? Being a little bit more interactive in the process so you can gauge, 
is it working, is it not working, and also having some kind of timeline, because otherwise you could be you know, in it for two years and you don't really know what they're doing and then you've wasted all that money as mm. well. So being a bit more interactive is important. In this day and age where most parents, both parents are working, mm. uh, you find that when they get home in the evenings they're way too exhausted to yeah. sit with the kids with homework etc. Mm. And a lot of them then opt to have uh, children go for extra lessons and tuition, also hoping that in that time that the children's homework and projects etc. are attended to. Yeah. Is that fair? number one and number two how much does it take away from the child mm. in terms of his interaction with his parents mm. and um, you know would the parents then truly understand what's going on in the child's mm. life I think yeah I think it comes with its pros and cons so on the one hand it is helpful because maybe when the parents get home and all the homework's complete you can actually sit down with your child and not worry about work and complain about the work and just bond with them a little and find out how they're doing and reconnect um, so on one hand it can be quite helpful on the other hand I don't know if sometimes that amount of time is enough sometimes to do all the kids homework and projects and studying so there often has to be a carryover after that tuition to maybe continue with something at home and maybe that's when parents do need to be a little bit more helpful and say okay there's still this project that needs to be done what do you need help with um, I think parents need to be involved in terms of understanding what's you know when exams are when tests are when projects are due because sometimes kids do forget and um, you can't rely on one person to manage that alone you also maybe have to be a slightly involved but it does take away maybe those arguments parents have with kids when they're frustrated after a long day of work and they come home and this child's just not in the mood for doing homework and it's fighting and arguing at least takes a little bit of that away as well okay I'm talking to Cara Blackie she's an educational psychologist we're talking about tuition or tuition depending how you pronounce it both is correct the one is American the one is British so you know are you into sending your children for extra lessons do they need it um, if they don't need it why are they going for extra lessons is it about just giving them that extra edge and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that why not if that's going to make your child a high achiever then why not what are your thoughts what are the difficulties you having with your children well we have the educational psychologist with us in the studio Cara Blackie and we're happy to take your calls the, uh, the number does um, appear at the bottom of our screen Okay, but uh, what I do want to advise our listeners is let's take the ad break first and then we'll take your call. So do call in and uh, pose your questions to our expert, Cara Blackie. Welcome back. This is Let's Talk, a show for women, about women, with women. We, the pillars of society, um, look forward to keeping you company every Wednesdays and Saturday mornings on Let's Talk. And we'd love to hear from you. Our lines are open and you can call in with questions or comments. We do have a specialist uh, in studio with us, Cara Blackie, educational psychologist. So if you have any issues you want to raise with her about your child, about uh, problems with uh, him at school or just anything on the top of your head about education we're happy to take those calls right now we continue our discussion with you Cara and mm. um, tuition or tuition for your children yeah. um, I think there's also a fear around um, the credibility of the tutor mm. how does one go about vetting that this person is above board um, there's no issues about um, abuse of children yeah. um, sadly and I don't want to generalize here but a lot of um, children that have been abused mm -hmm. has been by people who have uh, you know been the caregivers mm. of sorts yeah so teachers and yes. um, you know coaches yeah. sport coaches um, and even tutors yeah. so how does a parent ensure that they put in their children safety well-being mm -hmm and educational needs in mm. absolutely the right hands. And I think it is hard because you, you meet people and they, they come across perfect and you know have enthusiasm that they would be able to help. And so it's quite hard to judge are they the best person 
Can I leave my child with them? Can they be left in my house? It's quite difficult to sort of gauge that. And sometimes that's where parents may want to go through a tutor company. So someone who maybe, you know, interviews people beforehand, knows a bit about their background check, tries to match children with tutor as well. So then there's a good sort of balance between, um, you know, when they're working, so they sort of match each other. So sometimes going through a company can be quite helpful because you know they've sort of done a bit more of a background check. If you find your own, then sometimes it is helpful to to talk to people in your community, see who's worked with people before, um, and then also be around a little bit to to observe them and see if they're helping in the way that you want to help. But then also be, as a parent, sort of be a little bit more um, directive with what you want them to do. So instead of just saying, oh, come and help them with English and maths, but be a little bit more directive. Like, you know, I would want you to help them when it comes to exams on how to study, or I would like help with this, this, this. So at least you sort of have an idea and they have an idea of what your expectations are as well. And either they can say if they have those skills or if they wouldn't be able to assist as well. But it is quite a a difficult choice and I think parents need to meet people, need to maybe observe a little bit and also take their child's opinion. What is the tutor's role? I mean you spoke mm. about helping with homework, yeah. um, coaching the child, helping mm. them um, you know uh, with uh, their study mm. time, teach them how to study for the exams mm. etc. Now that's very broad yeah. and yeah. I'm wondering does this fall within the ambit of the tutor? Not always. Is he or she supposed to be doing all of that? Not always, because there isn't enough time sometimes. Mm. And so the problem is, is that children often have so much homework. By the time they've done their homework, there's not much time to do anything else. And that's where parents could possibly then try and if they've got the time to assist. So if they are at home, maybe do the homework with them or get the child to do the homework individually and rather focus on areas of weakness or difficulty with the child. Mm -hmm. And that's where the tutor can maybe help. So when it comes to a test, try and test them beforehand, help them with how to study. But it depends on what the child's needs are. Mm -hmm. You know, is it just the homework and having someone there or is it something a little bit more that they need? Okay, I'm talking to Cara Blackie, she's an educational psychologist. We're talking about tutoring and any other issues that you might have with your child's learning. Do call in, she is the expert, she is in studio with us. Call us in studio and we'll be more than happy to take your calls. Uh, still to come in the program, we're going to be talking to um, an activist. She's going to talk to us about genetically modified foods, everything you need to know about it. And we'll be wrapping up about uh, to, to talk about diets. We'll have a dietitian in studio and we'll be talking about the do's and don'ts of dieting. Hopefully how to lose weight permanently and also what to put in your lunch boxes. So all of that on the show this morning. Do call our studio lines are open. Cara, back to mm -hmm. you. Now, when we talk about children, we talk about tutoring, preparing them for mm -hmm. exams, etc. All of this comes at a cost. Yeah. We've heard about uh, elect electricity tariffs, you yeah. know, being hiked. We're talking about uh, food prices mm -hmm. going up and parents are going to look at ways to, to trim their budgets. Yeah. This might be one of the things they might decide to cut out because yeah. of cost uh, factors. What about online tutoring? Is that perhaps a route parents could go? What can it offer you? Can it work for parents? Or would that mean parents have to be more hands-on with their children? Yeah, a little bit more. I think if parents have that time at home, then um, they could possibly cut out a bit of this extra tuition. Um, sometimes it, it does get harder when it's something that parents aren't 100% familiar with. You know, work is changing a lot. So if you look at what they've been taught in maths, things have changed. So sometimes parents may not be able to assist at all um, and may be totally out of their, their framework. Um, you know, online tuition could work, but I think then you know, there's, you're missing that connection with someone, you know, and sometimes kids need that person with them. You know, they get a bit distracted and they procrastinate. And so I do think, you know, online might help a little bit, but it could also result in a bit of distractions as well. You know, now you're on the computer and let me search this and do yes. this. So it could add in another whole ball game. but if parents are sort of helping them in some ways, you know, then, you know, maybe then it could be quite helpful. And that's where sometimes... You know, if you're in a community where you know there's, you know, there's a few kids similar age, maybe getting all of them to come to one house and one person come and sort of teach them and help them could also be something if you're trying to cut down on costs. Because 
at the end of the day, kids just need that slight attention, mm. that slight sort of one-on-one -on -one where they're at, not where somebody else is at, but where they're at. And so we don't also want to lose that, where online tuition may not always be able to gauge where that child is at and where to assist. That's actually a brilliant suggestion because uh, if both parents are working, yeah. you often wonder who is there minding the children. Yeah. You know, you need a bit of super uh, supervision yeah. because you really don't know what older kids mm. could and would get up to. And of course, it's not the tutor's role to babysit them, yes. but I guess in a lot of instances, parents kind of get that um, peace of mind that my child is with the tutor, mm. He or she is safe, yeah. um, and they're also learning or enhancing their skills yes. in some way. So I guess it's uh, you know it comes at a price, yes. but it definitely gives parents yeah. peace of mind, does it not? Yeah, definitely. And I think with all the pressure that's placed on kids today and how they perform and trying to get into university and the marks they require, I think that we can't slack on children's education. If a child is struggling, we need to address it. We can't just say, okay, well they don't need the subject when they get older because those marks all count unfortunately and so it's really difficult because you want to also boost their confidence you don't want them to feel like they can't do it therefore just give up and just hopefully pass it you want to be able to help children so they feel confident so they have a goal as well so you know really helping kids is vitally important rather than just sort of hoping their problems will go away and you know as they get older they should do it all by themselves often that doesn't really happen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, tutoring older children mm -hmm. um, and also as far as maths and science mm -hmm. is concerned, would you advise parents to start at the earliest age possible to give that child possibly the edge going forward? Because there's mm -hmm. more, you know, there just seems to be a call for mm. maths and science. Mm. Um, schools, education department, mm. business is saying mm. that um, there's just not enough focus on maths yeah. and science. We don't even probably have enough maths and science teachers. Yeah, I think definitely the earlier you can get children to be interested in those subjects and feel confident in those subjects, the better. Um, but we have to gauge when a child is young that they still have to be a child. So if they're six or seven, I wouldn't send them for extra math lessons every day because they will soon hate it because it will soon become quite boring and they won't want to do it. So it's finding that balance, making it still that they're learning a lot and maybe getting that extra edge, but it's not taking away from them also being young kids and also wanting to go out and play with their friends or, you know, just relax after school and maybe not do so much. So there's certain sort of um, different frameworks, especially with maths and science, that can either be sort of a, quite repetitive, a lot of work, and that works for some kids and it doesn't work for others. It can sometimes push kids in the opposite direction where they never want to do it again. So having that balance, giving them maybe a bit of extra assistance or extra sort of support, but not overwhelming them because that can have the the opposite effect. Okay, my final question mm. for this part of the interview. Let's go right back to assessments. Yes. Um, is it necessary and would your assessments show up, mm -hmm. you know, when the child just starts mm -hmm. school at six, seven or eight, that this child has got, um, you know, has got a head for figures for maths mm -hmm. and science? Mm -hmm. would, that, uh, would the assessments show that up and should parents then start honing mm -hmm. the children in that direction? Yeah, I think if you do a full sort of assessment, you can get a gauge of where their strengths and weaknesses are. And from their strengths, you can look at sort of what subjects that may sort of relate to. So it's quite hard when they're six or seven to really gauge as numeracy or literacy or what sort of their strengths are. But you can sort of see where their sort of natural potential comes from, what they understand, how they work with things, how they... Um, learn. So it's quite helpful to have a good indication, okay, are they more of a visual learner? Do they pick up more from auditory information? Do they need to make something or do something while they're learning? So it helps to have an indication of how your child learns and then you can sort of hone in on those strengths because I think we tend to forget the strengths and we just want to work on the weaknesses but also focusing on kids' strengths and being like, this is what you're really good at and promoting that and encouraging them to focus on that. 
Okay, lots more questions, but we're going to have to leave yes. it for now. It's been wonderful chatting to you. Thank you so much for being with us Thank in the you. studio. Cara Blackie, educational psychologist, talking to us about assessments and tutoring. I certainly hope you've managed to get some important information out of this interview. And Cara has said she'd love to come back. Uh, you know, sometime soon to talk some more about children and education. So thank you for watching this segment of the show. We're going to be taking an ad break now, and when we get back, our next uh, guest is on standby. We're going to talk genetically modified foods. Welcome back and thank you for letting us into your hearts and into your home. It's great to be with you here on Let's Talk. Do remember we will be with you every uh, Saturday and Wednesday mornings between 8.30 and 10. Now we've had a slight change in our program. Um, I think our next guest is stuck in traffic, but uh, we do have Fatima Bax who's joined us, the dietitian. Remember all the promises I've made? We're going to give you, well, we're going to ask her to give us a foolproof diet. We're into the third month of the new year, and I know lots of us are still battling to rid ourselves of those extra festive kilos. I certainly am, and I hope she's going to tell us just how to do it without too much hard work. And then we're also going to tell you what to put in the kids' lunch boxes. That's a constant battle, isn't it? All of us, you know, we kind of pull our hair out and what do I give the kid? And sometimes kids come home with uneaten lunch because they don't enjoy what we've put in their lunch boxes. Well, the expert's here once again, and we're going to hear from her. But also a reminder to you, our valued viewers, that the lines are open throughout the show. So if you want to call in and make a comment or ask any questions, we're more than happy to take your calls. So do join us. Salaamu Alaikum to you, Fatima. Welcome to the program. Wa Alaikum Salaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Thank you so much for having me, Julie. My pleasure entirely. <coughs> now, I'm sure wherever you go, you are cornered and people want the, the secret, you know, or you, you just absolutely have to tell us what is a foolproof diet. I'm sure you're cornered about this all the time. I'm sorry, Julie, but I think I'm going to disappoint you. Yes, <laughs> to your question, I do get cornered all the time. But unfortunately, there's no magic bullet. Oh, so no. in life, everything requires p patience, perseverance, and just persistence in what you do. And often we just look for the easy way out of everything, you know. Unfortunately, our lives have become a bit more westernized, urbanized. And here living in Johannesburg, I mean, you just cannot help but get caught up in the rat race, you know. Mm -hmm. And you get sucked in. And as mums, if you're working mums, you still have to see to the house, see to your children, be a driver, a cook. And so you're on the run all the time. So we're always looking for quick fixes and easy things. And often these are not necessarily healthy. So uh, our foods have moved from wholesome foods to what's the quick, easy, prepared ones that are refined, processed. You go to a shelf, I mean, any supermarket shelf or any store, and you can get a salad off the shelf, or you can get cooked food off the shelf, you know. But what does it actually entail when you choose to actually choose, pick that particular item off the shelf versus prepare it from scratch. And yes, I do know it's not easy. I'm a mom of five children, four of which, I mean, my eldest turned 21 Not last sure, week. Huh? And then I have a lot, Lamaki, who's four and a half. So I know it's not easy to be a working mom and then to uh, actually put in effort. But I think once you prepare beforehand and you know what you need to do, then it can all come together. But you know what? The only thing that's certain is uncertainty. There's always something that crops up and, you know, a child that's ill or something that prevents you from doing it. But I think as moms, as long as we know we're doing the best, not only for ourselves, but for our children, just by feeling that way or, or feeling good about what we do can actually then incentivize us to then prepare healthy meals, not only for us, but our families as well. Okay, let's talk about us girls first before we go to the kids. Uh, we know that the diet industry is a multi-billion dollar industry selling all sorts of quick fixes, uh, appetite suppressants, um, fat burners, um, oh gosh, just to name a few. What do you say to our viewers about that? You know, um, for me, I feel when a person is, to, is, is ready to take responsibility, for whatever it is they want to do in their lives. So whether it's a career, and now we're talking health. So when you decide, okay, I am deciding I want to live a healthy lifestyle. 
what does that healthy lifestyle entail? It means that I'm going to move more, I'm going to exercise, and then it means I'm going to eat healthy. So whichever particular, and that's why there isn't one diet that works for anyone. Uh -huh. And usually people who come to us as dietitians come as a last resort because they've tried everyone, everything from injections to tablets to, as you mentioned, appetite suppressants to everything. And, and we are looking for something that we can rely on. So that's why I really emphasize that actually taking responsibility. So then, whichever, whether you choose to come to me, whether you've happened to talk to a personal trainer, whether you've decided to try a pill, that, that particular moment will be the start of now leading a sort of a healthy lifestyle. But I think it's so important to know what you need to do or what we do, and maybe that's why we're so boring when we, we, we give advice, is we try to advise, or I would like to advise you, or, or, or just adult viewers, this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So it may seem boring, so how long are you going to take appetite suppressants for? How long are you going to, for example, just do juicing? Or how, how long are you going to just detox? So you can do, a, a detox for a certain period of time but it's what you're actually going to do for the rest of your life and so that's different stages so that's why it's not so exciting but it is important to have that end goal in my in mind and when you have that then you know okay so now I'm starting from here okay let me see what I'm going to do and that's for me that's the, the point and that's why no particular diet or person is can take responsibility. It's only us who will take responsibility when we're ready. Okay, Fatima, let me ask you this question. We hear about, and we've talked fad diets, we've talked about, uh, you know, taking a pill and thinking that that's going to cure, cure you of, uh, you know, your uh, obesity or, you know, for want of a better word. In terms of, you mentioned a few things there. You mentioned the juicing diet, you mentioned detoxing, and then, you know, you've got the banting that's yes. really in the news these days. Yes. And a whole host of other, uh, you know, miracle, supposedly miracle type of diets. When one chops and changes like that, so this month, let's assume one, you know, one week of the month, I'll do the juicing diet uh, and lose two or three Ks, feel great about myself and then go right back to where I started, start uh, binging, uh, very especially on the weekends, you know, <coughs> you binge uh, eat on the weekends and then. On, on a Monday you resolve you're going to start your diet again. So mm -hmm. you chop and change from different diets, not necessarily taking diet supplements, but just chopping and changing. Does that do any harm to your body? I think so, Julie. We, that's what we call yo-yo dieting. So what happens actually, and, and the sad part is that the media that we are exposed to, especially magazines, I mean, you look at a picture of a woman on a magazine and you say, I want to be like her. So we already start off not feeling good about ourselves. And the media, they're very clever. It's all about feeling. And as I was coming here, there was a billboard, and it was um, actually a carbonated beverage, so a sweetened drink. And, it's, and what was the caption? Enjoy the feeling. So when we're not feeling good about ourselves, and often, especially as women, we'll start off with, okay, I just need to lose two or three kilos. Okay, so let me juice for a week, and then I'll go back to eating. Or let me do this, starve myself and not eat any carbs, and then I'll, come, I'll, I'll go back. So it's almost as though doing something and we're going to come back. But coming back to what? So what often happens in that case, depending on how many different types of plans you're trying or diets you're trying, and then over a, month, a, a period of, say, two to three months, you then realize where if you, say, started at, say, 65 kilos and just wanted to lose two because you're comfortable at 62 or 63, and you're now three months later sitting at 68 kilos. Ooh. So sometimes what you're doing is you're actually setting your baseline higher each time because you're putting your body through very, um, it's, it's through di to different things. It's, it's, there's no consistency because the one minute it's juicing, the next minute it's something else. So the body doesn't know what to expect next. And then when you binge, for example, if you've starved yourself and then you binge and that sort of becomes a cycle for a short period of time, what your body says, I don't know when I'm going to get food again. So let me just store all of this. And so that's what it does. So I feel Firstly, it's so important to have a good self-esteem or come from a feeling of goodness and then look at what is your ultimate goal. We want to be healthy. I mean, sickness is so prevalent these days and, and uh, uh, our diets are really poor 
in, in quality, the quality. So we, what I say is we overfed, so we do oh, eat yes. enough, but we undernourished. Mm. So where do we get our vitamins and mineral f minerals from? You know, if you take a fast food meal, for example, consisting of, say, burger, fries, and, and a, a soft drink, you, you're going to get enough calories in terms of energy from there, but what, what nutrition are you getting? Are you getting any fiber? Are you getting any vitamins or minerals? No, we aren't. And, and, and often that's what we're guilty of. And or we, it's so easy to then just maybe get a pizza or more often than not, then give this to our family as well. So that's why planning is so important. And we are um, overindulging in sugars, are we not? At every <coughs> turn, whether it's our drinks, whether it's our canned foods, whether it's our frozen foods, it's heavily laden with sugars and preservatives. What is that doing to our bodies? You know, um, that's resulting in lots of cases of overweight and obesity. Now, not only in adults, it's in children. And we're also seeing a very increased in incidence of diabetes in, in children as well. We never saw diabetes. Previously, it would be either if you were insulin dependent, and that's what we would see commonly in, in young people, especially children. If it was, and we used to say adult onset or maturity onset diabetes, that's the type 2 diabetes. But now we're seeing that in young children and we're seeing lots of cases of insulin resistance. And that is because of the amount of sugar that's, that's eaten. Actually in 2012, there was a study done in South Africa. Um, it was called the SANHAIN, so the South African National Health Examination Survey. And the third most common food eaten was sugar. So after tea, and I think it was pup, then it, it, the, the third most eaten it, it was, was sugar. Imagine that. So that's quite scary. Mm. And also there was a, a study done over a period of 10 years. So I think it was from, not sure if it was 2000 to 2010. So they followed these children over that period of time. And their sugar intake increased from about, I think it was 8 to 10 teaspoons. And 10 years later, it was gone on to about 20 to 30 teaspoons of sugar a day on average. And so I'm quite glad about the sugar tax, <laughs> which will be implemented in 2017. Exactly. Because it is going to make us more aware. Right. I'm not saying sugar is a bad Okay, let's hold that okay. thought. We are going to take an ad break. And just to remind our listeners, uh, our viewers, in fact, that after the ad break, if you'd like to call in, we're happy to take your calls. Fatima's in studio with us if you have any questions around a specific diets or just some advice on health and well-being we're more than happy to take your calls and still to come in the program we're going to be talking about genetically modified foods this is let's talk I'm glad to be with you Assalamu alaikum, welcome back. This is Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. It's a women's show for women with women, but that doesn't exclude the brothers. Whenever they have something to say, they're more than welcome to join us on the show. Do call, do call us if you have any questions or comments. We'd love to hear from you. I have um, Fatima Bucks here. She is a, a dietitian, uh, and she's talking to us about um, healthy lifestyles. Um, and she's just um, really deflated, uh, you know, my balloon by saying there's absolutely no quick fix at all. Everything is hard work and dedication. So if you're wanting to lose a bit of weight, a healthy eating plan and exercise, you need to get the body moving. And do remember, if you want to call in, our line is appearing at the bottom of the screen. We'd love to hear from you. Fatima, back to you. Uh, we spoke about sugar, we're consuming way too much sugar, and we are not uh, moving about enough, are we? Not at all, um, Julie. There was actually this research done by a professor at uh, UCT, and she actually said, um, or she's done a research paper on is sitting the new smoking. So now we all know that smoking is bad for our health. Now sure. imagine sitting being compared to that. And we all guilty of it. I mean, we could very easily, as working parents, get up in the morning, yes, prepare breakfast, sit down, have your breakfast, get into the car, go to work, if you have an office job and you don't move. And this research has shown that even if you've exercised for half an hour that morning, but if you don't move at all for the day, that's very bad for your health. So that's adults. Okay, let me just ask you to hold that thought, please, if you don't mind. We have a call online. Assalamu alaikum to you and welcome to the show. 
Assalamualaikum salam. Uh, shukran uh, for a lovely program. Thank you. Uh, I completely agree with the dietitian. You know that uh, you know having your family eat healthy is really hard work because you know I'm I'm a grandmother now and um, before I was a grandmother I started you know eating healthy and it really took a lot of time and effort to do everything but I persevered and alhamdulillah I really. Uh, benefited from it but now with the grandchildren because my daughter you know she just visited me from Durban and she's completely organic but we had to sort of maintain a little son's way of eating and he would come to me in the mornings and ask me for a biscuit and because I didn't make biscuits regularly I now quickly had to get out the you know the gluten-free books and things like that and you know it's all about uh, yes you have to plan but also it's when you really want to do things that is good for your children and your grandchildren. And like for yourself like as well. Dietitian, I would like to ask the dietitian, you know, I'm struggling now to use a sugar substitute for, for him and all the other grandchildren. So what I've come up with is dates. I've cut that sugar completely. So I buy lots of dates and I liquidize it. And when I do the biscuits, I use the dates as a sweetener. Because the xylitol and all of those things are quite expensive. Is there anything else that she could recommend? Because I actually did it for him as a breakfast biscuit and he ate it and he took some to nursery school this morning. And they really like it and you feel good when you see your kids are eating something which is good for them and they're enjoying it. Great call. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll have uh, Fatima respond to that. Thank you so much. And what I really love is what the caller mentioned regarding an innovative ideas. So to get out of our comfort zone and to use dates. I agree totally. And I love the word of the use organic. So now what I have with me here are a few vegetables from my garden. And I, would in, I, I actually feel eating and life in general is going back to basics. So what I do believe firstly is to go green and to eat from the earth every day because we need to, earth, uh, to eat what Allah has provided for us. If it's anything out of the box or the tin or off the shelf, usually that has been processed. Mm -hmm. It doesn't grow as it is. For example, a tin or a sauce hasn't grown as it is. But this has. So here I've got some rosemary. Okay, could you show that to the camera? Okay. And like now this see. is all from my garden that I plucked this morning. So this is some rosemary. So, okay. so what I try to do is each day to, to, to eat from the earth or go into my garden and get something. So this morning I made omelets for all my family. And what I did was get the spring onion and the chilies from my garden. So okay. I would use that. Uh, what I didn't do, which I like to do often, is to get the spinach. So here I have some spinach leaves. So these are just two different types of spinach, and it's also from my garden. And to make a green juice with it. And maybe at some an, another time when we have an opportunity, I can just share how we go about it. It's very quick and easy. I think we'd love those fresh recipes. Okay, so the next so time you come on, just come yes, all but it's armed so with quick. your recipes. Okay, so now it's very quick. Actually, with the, with the green juice in the morning, it's just spinach, which I get from my garden. Um, then I would use any other green vegetable if it's a green juice, so cucumber, broccoli, kale, and then just to add to that some ginger, lemon, and so it's not too bitter. So my children can have it as well, which they do mm -hmm. like, is uh, a bit of pineapple and uh, some apple, just mm -hmm. to sweeten it. And our body sucks it up. So when I actually talk about being uh, or being nourished, that's exactly what I mean. This is what our body needs. We need, how often do we even go and put our feet on the grass or put our hands in the sand? True. This is an opportunity I found years ago, even to encourage my children to eat beans, which some of them they didn't like, but when, by go, growing the green beans and I take them to the garden, they would actually pick it off and rinse it and eat it there and then. I mean, how much more nourishing is that? And then I've got some basil here. Julie, you'll be able to smell it. I'm oh, yes. It. And I this also it. I set up with uh, a friend of mine who does something called biodynamic and organic gardening. And so you do, it's not, no pesticides in the soil. We actually would give the plants probiotics, which we ourselves would take. So um, basil, it's so lovely to make a pesto with, uh, say, some, some mm -hmm. garlic, um, as some nuts and the best a dip that you could have either with the salad or even with pasta and then some mint you can just have mint tea I also have some lemongrass so my my whole um, intention these days with all my clients and even like as I appear here today is to get people to go back to basics mm -hmm. 
to eat from the earth, to eat something, whether it's an apple from the tree, those have, have no labels. I don't need to then teach anyone to read labels, you know, but uh, to try. And yes, it, it, it may seem like, oh, it's so difficult, but on the long run, it just gets easy. All that's a bit challenging is the planning. So if you had made, say, salad for dinner last night, it's so easy to come home, especially as a mother. If we have a snack covered with biscuits and sweets and things, we're going to want to make a cup of tea and have that because it's the easiest thing to do. But if you have a prepared salad in the fridge, all you have to do is maybe add some olive oil, balsamic, some lemon juice, and there you got a salad and so you actually eat when you're hungry. So coming back <clears throat> to what the caller had said in terms of other ideas, again, I said I'm glad all sugar is out and, and dates is a lovely way. You can even make smoothies for children, even for adults, with dates. You can use avocado, some milk and yogurt, and then any other type of fruit. And it's very, very nutritious, healthy and filling, and it's quick and easy. So even if you have extra that you've made in the morning for a mom on the run, you could take that to work or to just keep it as an in-between snack. So initially, it may seem Okay, what do I mean? But if you just plan ahead, you can have everything, you know. And what we don't often do is the thing that we're lacking, especially for our children, is to eat enough fruit and vegetables. We often, okay, when we like the fruit in season, we may have two or three, which is the recommendation. So two to three fruit a day spread out. But how often do we actually binge on veggies? We don't, right? <laughs> so that, and that's, where we, that's what our body sucks up. That's what our body needs the most, the vitamins and minerals. I mean, if you look at the colors, I brought everything that's green. It's bright green. Um, all our vegetables and fruit, you know, it's nature's box of crayons, and we need to pick from there every day. So I think, um, I, ho I hope I've answered her question. What you could also use is honey, but I feel just to monitor the total... Uh, sort of sweetened intake for the day. So it's a good idea to s maybe write down sometimes for three or four days out of the week, two days being weekdays and two days weekend days, even for us uh, adults. And then just to see, because sometimes like, oh, I'm eating enough fruit, I'm having this, but when you actually write it down, you realize that you may be lacking in a it's lot of things. It's frightening when you keep a, <laughs> when you write it down. Unfortunately, <clears throat> that's all we have time for. When I think about writing down or make a mental note about what I've eaten, it actually shocks me. It's unbelievable. So there you have it. There's no quick fix. There's no magic pill if you want to lose weight. It's hard work, but if you plan properly, obviously it is doable. So plan your meals, start uh, gardening. Even if you have a tiny little garden, you will be able to you know, grow something in the garden and eat off or out of the earth, right out of the earth. Everything the healthy way and the right way. So that was uh, from Fatima Bucks, our dietitian. Thank you indeed for being with us. Till the next time, inshallah. And we're going to take an ad break, but just to remind you, after the ad break, the lines will be open and you can call us with questions or co comments. We are happy to hear from you. Welcome back. We're into the final segment of the show this morning. Let's talk with me, Julie Ali. As I've been saying to you, it's a show for women, about women and with women. Great to be here, and thank you for those callers uh, that called in this morning. Um, next up, we're going to be talking to uh, Zakia Isma. She's an activist. She calls herself a consumer campaigner. And we're going to be talking about um, genetically modified foods. What is genetically modified foods? Why do we have it on the market? Who is it that's consuming these foods? Is it you and I? So what does that mean to our health? How vigilant do you and I have to be as housewives? Are we even remotely aware just how serious the situation is? Or are there just a couple of activists out there trying to campaign for something that um, they believe needs to be heard? Salaamu Alaikum, welcome. Walaikum Salaam, thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you for being with nice. us. Genetically modified mm. foods, there's a lot of hype around it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm just wondering, is it something we ought to be taking seriously enough? What is it? What type of foods does it appear in? And how harmful is it really to our health? But before we get there, okay. Zakia Isma, so nice having you on the show with us this Thanks. morning. I hope you relaxed. I heard you were caught up in yes. traffic. <laughs> okay. Trying to, yeah. Why the activism against gen genetically modified okay. foods? So I, um, being a mother, wanting to, you know, be a good mother, 
feed my family some healthy food, eat healthy food, um, came across, uh, read about genetically modified foods and started reading and understanding what it was. But all this time I was so glad we live in South Africa where we don't have genetically modified foods. Don't we? No, we do. Oh. And I was really glad and relaxed and then I bumped into um, a few things and then I realized that not only do we have genetically modified foods, we're the only country in the world that has genetically modified our staple, maize meal. And I was so shocked because we eat, we eat, uh, we used to eat a lot of maize meal. It's one of our very quick go-to meals if I was busy or, you know, that kind of thing. I saw maize in everything, soya in everything. And I realized that not many people knew this. And so I found the African Center for Biodiversity who has been doing a lot of work for the past 10 years. Last year was our 10 year anniversary on this. And they, you know, with very, had very little funding they, uh, to do consumer awareness work. And I came on and I said, listen, I'm going to do this for you, for, for people. We, you know, we all need to know, we need to have choices in what we eat. And that was five years ago and we have you're still going strong. We're going strong, yes. But you're now campaigning against GM foods, which you're now saying is in our maize. Mm. And uh, the majority of our population eat maize because it is the staple. Yes. I understand it also appears in baby foods and almost everything that we eat. Yes. What does it harm? What, what sort of harm does it do to us? So because it's, it's such a new thing, it's a novel thing, right? Um, that when the genes, so can, if I can explain what it is, sure. like just so you understand that, um, we've had farmers crossbreeding for millions of years, different kinds of, you know, maize or soya, and to get the kind of, you know, kind of maize produce that they want. So now scientists have said, okay, we know how to identify genes that express a specific um, quality. And we know how to extract that from it, something and we know how to put it into something else. So that's where the genetic modification comes in, where we're taking uh, genes from other organisms and we're putting it into the maize organism in a lab. To give you a healthier crop? No. <laughs> or a bountiful crop? No. To give you, well, so there's two kinds. So with all the billions and billions of dollars that have been spent over the past 30 years on GM foods and they've been trying to do a vitamin A gold, called golden rice and you know that's that's the hope but it's just hype. These are the modifications we have on our growing on our farms. The one modification is it's called an insect resistant plant. What that means is the plant in, produces the toxin that kills the insects inside it. Okay. So every single cell produces a tiny amount of toxins. So when those worms come and they come and eat, they slowly get sick. So it's interfering with the natural ecology yes. of the area. Yeah. So, that, so, so now we don't have our insecticide on top, we have it inside. So when you bring it home, that maize, that maize still has that insecticide in it because it's inbuilt, it's part of the, um, the structure, it's part of the product. It's not. So, you know, like Fatima was saying earlier, the pesticides are a problem. This is so problematic because it's produced in the, in the plant. And we often ask where are all the cancers and all these new dreaded mm. diseases coming from? So perhaps this is the answer. Perhaps it is. Um, th that's the one modification, okay? So it create, it's, it's had its built-in insect uh, pesticide. Um, but farmers still have to f spray other pesticides because that only kills certain insects. There are other pests that they have to spray for. And they still spray herbicides to kill off the other weeds. So we're getting a very toxic mix of food. Now the problem comes in is that um, our governments are saying, okay, so if you want to come bring in GM foods into our country, you first have to apply, for, uh, you know, get a permit and get approval. And you must submit some data to tell us that it's, you know, what it is and why and how and is it safe. And this now, this is where we come in. So how, did, how do we know that smoking is unhealthy for us? Or how long after smoking became mainstream did we find out it was unhealthy? Because they did, you know, small little tests and said, oh, no, look, they're fine. 
right? So the same thing with uh, GM crops. There is so an you independent don't have testing. evidence, a big yes. piece of evidence to suggest that it is in fact very harmful. We have, we have some independent evidence that suggests that the, that shows problems. So there were there was like one what? there was a rat study. So the Monsanto and the companies they would do like maximum a 90 day study on rats. So uh, the spring scientists said, okay, let's do e the exact study, the same protocol, same rats, same amount of feeding, everything identical, but we're going to do it over the life st a life term of the rat and see what happens. And these rats that were fed the GM stuff got much sicker. They got tumors, they had various other problems. I mean, if you see the photos, there's huge, ugly rats, you know, ugly um, tumors. Um, so over the life, life cycle, it said, okay, this is problematic. So what does it mean for people who eat it? On another, in another country, um, what they did was they just separated their, their livestock and some, the one half got no GM foods whatsoever and the others got the normal GM food, soya, maize, just the way we would eat it in our food um, system. And at the end of their natural lives, then they did all these tests, you know, they cut up the, um, they measured and looked at all the organs, they looked at the cell structure, etc. And they found stomach inflammation in the, in the animals that ate GM food. They found the female, the uterus was like 25% heavier. So what does that mean? Is, I mean, we don't know. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? What we do know is it has a different effect from conventional maize and soya. Mm -hmm. um, stomach inflammation we already know. And that tells us two other things. It tells us we're eating diseased animals because our, all the meat we eat are factory farmed. They don't eat grass. They eat mm -hmm. corn and soya, right? They eat GM corn and GM soya. So these animals that we eat are diseased. So not only are we eating diseased animals, we're e eating diseased crops as but well. But now in South Africa, because we eat it as a staple. So in Argentina and other places, they just, it goes mainly to animal processing. But in South Africa, we eat it as our staple. Mm -hmm. So from babies, you know, start with... Um, Cereals. Yeah, with uh, pap or, you know, maize porridge or something. What, what food, what other foods does mm. the GM substances appear in? Uh, what do our consumers start to be, you know, what do we yeah. need to look out for? So or anything with maize, so our maize meal and then anything with soya. And if you look at all processed foods, in fact, even like yogurt now has cornstarch. I mean, it's very hard to just find yogurt with full cream milk and the culture. There's stabilizers. There's, mm -hmm. So there's, there's, there's derivatives of maize and corn in everything. So bread has soya flour which ACB submitted for testing. Can and I ask you yes. to hold that thought, right. please? Uh. Salaamu Alaikum to our caller. Welcome to the show. Alaikum Salaam. Thank you for a very informative and I think very vital program. Thank you indeed. I'm listening to, uh, you know, your, your activists and uh, I've uh, been over the years, you know, trying to keep tabs on what's happening with genetic modification. But I'm asking the question, what is the halal body doing about this? Oh. When the Quran specifically stipulates that food must be whole, uh, must be good and wholesome, yes. and that draws a very thin line, I think, between halal and haram. But the health bodies are just focusing on the uh, hal slaughtering. What about these foods? Why mm -hmm. are they not going in and investigating? And I think it's very important that the halal bodies they should have food technologists and these kind of people on board to be able to guide in because I think they are very much lacking in doing a proper job. Brilliant Thank question you. and brilliant comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you indeed for your call, sister. Absolutely. Amazing. Yes. We, you know, I mean, yeah. how many of us think along those mm. lines? Because it's a way of growing food that does undue harm to the people, to farm workers, to the broader environment, to non-target insects. It flows into the water, what happens there, we make our animals sick before we slaughter them. Um, and that isn't consistent with the values and uh, our understanding of our, our place in nature and society as human beings. Um, so I think as a Muslim community, it's something that they need to really talk about very seriously and uh, advocate for a different kind of food system. 
Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the villain of the piece. I understand okay. it's a company called Monsanto. Yes. What is happening in that area? I mean, they're an American-based company. Mm. And I understand that uh, farmers are now co-opted and forced to buy feed and maize, etc., uh, seeds from them. How does this all work? So Monsanto is not the only player, but they're the biggest player. So in South Africa, with all our um, approvals, I think only one is a non-Monsanto approval. And we have like over 50, maybe more actually. Um, also, they, so now this is a company whose origins are in chemical warfare. So, you know, Agent Orange in Vietnam and DDT and all these things. They said, no, it's safe. Trust us. Sorry for yes. the interruption. Is DDT not banned the world over? Um, not everywhere. Not everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when they introduced it, it was safe. Mm. Okay, then there's the time gap. And even now in GM Foods, there's the time gap, and then the studies start coming out. Um, Agent Orange was safe. Aspartum was safe. You know, now the, after the time gap, the studies start coming out. Um, so, so now we've now, so Monsanto has bought up a whole lot of seed companies all over the world. In fact, they also buy up organic seed companies. So they take those things off the market. They buy it and they take it off the market. Conventional seeds, they buy them, and they can only do their gene modification in already well-performing seeds. So, you know, you said, you know, the drought. Um, the the so these are seeds, uh, people in third world countries. Yeah. This uh, GM modified maize mm. and the seeds that mm. are being offered to mm. them seems to be the answer to their prayers because in the past they used to lose crops either through floods or through droughts, okay. severe droughts, which we are experiencing yes. currently in South Africa. Um, and you would think that that's the answer, but you're suggesting otherwise. Well, we're in a drought at the moment, and you're hearing on the radio about food price pressures, that we've struggled with our maize and our, our crops. But all these crops are, they're genetic, I mean, not all, the, all the maize crops, 80% of our maize is planted to GM. And it didn't do well in the drought, you see. So that's just hype, again. Mm -hmm. Um, they're trying to come up with a drought, they call it uh, a water efficient maize for Africa thing, which, uh, which they've applied for to bring into South Africa, which ACB is objecting to. Because again, it's not really water efficient. It's just taking already good performing crops, putting in genes, technology that they own, and here comes the problem. They painted it. So now we're allowing companies to patent life forms, seeds, right? And if 80% of your staple is genetically modified, that means 80% of your seeds come from a patent from a corporate company that owns the seeds. They have, they don't, so even when you, you know, the next year when you harvest, you don't set aside seeds to replant. You have to buy again because you don't own that product. You license it. So now you've taken farming systems that have worked, where farmers have saved seeds, they've shared, they've improved on. Now they can't do any of that because they don't own. So they, it's their land, their water, they plant, they harvest. Their and work. Then their work. And then Monsanto says, hang on, we own that. You can only sell it to this or whatever. So the big companies are getting richer and the poor people are getting yes. poorer. The poor yes. farmers are working hard, mm. working themselves to the bone, but they then technically don't own the stuff. Yeah. Um, where to, um, we've got about five minutes to wrap okay. up time, I think. Okay. So where to from here? How much of work have you know, you people been doing, um, you know, the, the, G, uh, the GM activists in mm. South Africa and worldwide? Okay. Um, you've talked to government already. They busy with ongoing studies? No, What's government, is, government doesn't study. Government looks at companies and say, okay, you, it looks fine and we'll approve it. And then there's no oversight thereafter. So when crops fail, so even these insect resist, resistant crops, they failed now because the insects have adapted. So now we need more toxic mix. The weeds have adapted. So now we're getting more toxic crops coming in. So I think for consumers, the important thing to do is to say absolutely no. No, 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 because it starts with us. When, they, when consumers said no to the baby foods, baby food companies change. When they said no to that um, <clears throat> future life, you know, they moved to uh, GM-free. Um, 
some of the spas in, in places where consumers said, I believe you use GM soya flour in your bread and this is not acceptable. There's the local bakery said, no problem, we'll make you... Uh, what proof have you as mm, an activist yeah. that they are totally GM free? They may have just appeased you for that little while mm. and then sneak in the GM stuff, the, the, the GM substitutes, because it's cheaper and it's plentiful. Yeah. So that means yeah. a lot of resources on your part to keep mm. a beady eye open mm. on them, to continuously monitor that uh, they are GM free. And it's costly. It's costly. So we have to use funds to buy the products, send it into an independent lab um, for testing. And I don't, I don't think they would really cheat because them, you know, because they know as soon as we get funds, at some point we're going to do a sneak test. And um, but I mean, some of the companies, if you contact them, they'll show you their testing reports. Mm -hmm. And we all use. There's only one lab facility. They charge. They don't care whether you. They have. An NGO they just, or not. They just test. You know. Right. So they're not in. They a very neutral party. So now yeah. people listening in, mm. to watching the show today, mm. um, don't like what they've heard. They're worried. They're okay. worried about the diseases that mm. are spreading amongst them and the families. Yeah. We are seeing more and more cancers and other dreaded diseases mm. presenting and proliferating yeah. throughout families and communities. What is the alternative? Because organic farming is very expensive and beyond the reach of a lot of people. Of most people. I think... Um, for now, given what we have, is just to avoid the maize and soya and to read the labels. Because now the labeling has sort of kicked in and companies are taking it up very slowly and it will say produced using genetically modific genetic modification or maybe. And if it says maybe genetically modified, it means it's more than definitely genetically modified, but we're too much of, um, uh, we're too much of cowards to actually be honest with you. That's what they're really saying. So what... Um, even if it's not organic, just conventionally grown, non-GM. So it still has pesticides, etc. But at least you're taking away... It's a safer bet. You, it's a safer bet. You're taking away the patenting and the, you know, because in that maze, that packet of maize you buy, you have to pay for that technology and the profits. And, I mean, Monsanto makes $15 billion a year mm -hmm. on the pesticide and their Roundup, their glyphosate. And I just want to say quickly that the, the glyphosate that they that they spray on the weeds, um, that has its own problems. And the World Health, Health Organization has just classified, his, uh, classified it as a probable carcinogen. Mm. So if it's a probable carcinogen, there's no safe level to have it in our food. But we have maximum, minimum residue levels that you're allowed to have glyphosate in your food. But you, that's based on old research where Monsanto said, oh, it's perfectly safe, you can drink a glass and it's, you know, nothing will happen. But now we know that it's, um, it's a probable carcinogen, so there's no safe level. But we're having it every day in some foods, in some forms, every, you know, and it's building up. So it's really important, just read the labels and stay away from them. That's really so your option. I think our pra daily practice should be every time you go to the supermarket to do your shopping, read your labels. Yes. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be organic, but as long as it's GM free, mm. you're pretty safe. Not safe, not, not safe. completely safe, but it's safe the next enough. Step. It's, it's the next step. It's yeah. uh, the less of the two evils. But to also engage with companies in government and write to them and say, I'm, you know, I'm really not happy that you're doing this. I want, I demand an all GM free alternative. Because as consumers, you should have a right to choice. You have a right to know, but you also should have a right to choose. And that choice has been taken away from us. So now we're being force-fed GM mm -hmm. foods, you see. That is not a, not a democratic society mm. when you don't have any food democracy. You need to... Okay, yeah. we're going to wrap up, Zakia. Okay. Your, um, your message to people watching us today mm. um, and, you know, what is it that you need to say to them and how do they spread the word? Because clearly it's a very worrying situation. I think inform yourself, inform everybody else, but then change your purchasing decisions. But let the companies know that you went to the store and said, I chose not to buy your product because it was genetically modified and I chose something else.
And how can we support your organization? Our what website, do you want from us? Our website, acbio.org.za, if you come there, subscribe to our newsletters, then you can support our campaigns and petitions, our Facebook page, African Center for Biodiversity, engage with us, share our stuff, and just talk to us, you know, we're very happy to engage and say, okay, do this, do that, that you know, that kind of thing. Thank you for sharing that very frightening <laughs> um, statistics with us. It's not easy at all, you know, switching from GM to non-GM foods and organic. It is a big shift. It is costly. And sadly, it's the poorest of the poor, mm. once again, that, you know, bear the burden and the brunt of this um, horrible action by Monsanto and other greedy industry players. That then brings us to the end of the show. Thank you for being with us. And let's end off with our quote of the day. It's not your beliefs that make you a better person. It's your actions. Mm. From the Let's uh, Talk team here at ITV, Shukran for being with us. It's been a wonderful hour and a half. Till Saturday morning at the same time as always, it is Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh from me, Julie Ali, and everyone at Let's Talk. <laughs> Ya hello, 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 ya hello